the subject that I want to address is the notion of urbanizing technology, which is a project that is uh, very generously supported by Audi. And I heard several people are so supported. And, and, and one, one key issue is the encounter between complex intelligent systems, which tend to be closed systems, and the city, which is an open system. So, so one, one um, issue, issue that emerges here is the risk of technological obsolescence. So, you know, and what the image that I have is a fairly complex intelligent system, an exaggerated element, as if you plopped it down inside a building. And that system, even if you have choices, is actually a closed system. It's not interactive. And the rate of obsolescence of technologies is accelerating. And on the other hand, you have cities that have outlived all kinds of other systems. And you have functioning cities with many buildings that are 200 years old or 300. And so the contrast between this accelerated technological obsolescence, the fact that you plop down these technologies inside buildings, and what do you get? Do you eventually get dead cities? And I hope this image shows well, and even deader cities. And this is sort of a challenge, I would argue. Again, when you think of the city, complex system, but incomplete. And in that incompleteness lies its capacity to outlive all kinds of other systems. Uh, republics, empires, multinational corporations, financial firms. So there is something quite admirable about the city. And then, the challenge is how do we urbanize technology? Not all technology. A data pipeline does not need to be urbanized. You know, it's a basic infrastructure. But a lot of these technical systems that interact with buildings and supposedly interact with users of buildings, there lies the challenge, I would say. Now, um, for me, one, one key issue is what happens with technologies in interactive domains. And it seems to me that, that um, the specific technical capabilities of interactive technologies, and again, think of technologies inside systems, the inside buildings that are meant to be interactive. And that is sort of the, the situation, if you want. Now, the, the, the particular feature that I sort of really like about interactive domains is that they actually deliver their utilities through ecologies that are larger than the technology itself. So you are actually already dealing with a mixed domain. It is already, in a way, uh, in this case, not an urbanizing, but something a modifying. It's not just the technological features. And one way of putting it is that in the interactive domain, and I, I really emphasize interactive domains. In other words, there are all kinds of uh, other elements that we bring into that digital interactive domain. In a way, it hacks, it unsettles, it distorts the logic of the engineer who designed that technical system. And that is a bit the image that I then want to expand to the city and the notion that the city talks back that the city knows what works and what doesn't work. Now the system, the city is a complex uh, system. So one way of putting it is the city as hacker. There's a lot of stuff on hacking the city. I'm actually more interested. I mean, that is also very interesting. I've also worked on that. But I'm really interested in notion, the notion that the city can hack systems. And so, you know, spaces, technologies. In other words, the city can hack spaces, technologies. And here I have, a, I, there is no time. This third point has to do with, with a kind of urban capability that can alter, transform into a public good in a city. What starts as very individual, selfish, at the limit, you know, uh, uh, actions. And, and, and the example that I like to mention is a park in New York City that had become very, very dangerous, Riverside Park. And then you have, in the 1980s, you have this new generation of young professionals heading for Wall Street, etc. They love the buildings, really beautiful buildings. They all buy buildings there, but it's a dangerous park. And so what do you do when it's dangerous in New York City? You get a dog, and you get a big dog. And in fact, they got dogs that were like little horses. That's how big they were. 
if you have a dog, you have to walk the dog. So no matter how selfish we can imagine these people to be, you know, they're busy making piles of money, um, but they have to walk the dogs. And in walking the dogs with those dogs, they actually make the park safe for others. Now, I want to recover there uh, an urban capability. And one way of putting it, for those of you who like this kind of stuff, uh, it is like defeating the prisoner's dilemma. You know, this famous... Uh, so anyhow, no, no time to elaborate too much. And then finally, of course, the city as hacker of excessively rigid technological systems. Now, one way of thinking the city as hacker, and, and in a very elementary way, is, is uh, a car, an Audi, <laughs> made with, is this BMW sponsored or Audi? Oh my god, I don't know which one, anyhow. Um, <laughs> did me into trouble. But um, made for long distance, extraordinary speed, able to handle any terrain. And then it arrives at the center of a crowded city. And it is reduced to another type of, its DNA is altered. It has to crawl. It has to underutilize all its features. I would say the city has spoken. It has said, you can do that on the highway. You cannot do that inside the city. And in fact, out of that comes a response. The smart city, you know, the, the sort of the urbanized little car, if you want, that you don't want to take on the highway, frankly. Um, now, in that sense, in that example, and in so many others that I cannot talk about, the city tells us what works. You know, it's an interesting knowledge partner. It's not just something that lies there passive. And I think one of the challenges really is to recover that capacity of the city to tell us this doesn't work, this works. And, and one way of putting it is that in our overcrowded cities, in our huge, you know, overwhelmed cities, we, we no longer understand that language. Now, when we think of the piazza, we adore, we all adore the little Italian towns with their little piazzas, etc. You know, that is a place where those people still know how to understand the speech of the city. I mean, at, at, I like to use this notion of speech, you know, as legal scholars use it. Like, do corporations have speech, you know? And I say, my question, this is sort of part of this research on urbanizing technology, is does the city have speech? You know, does it actually tell us? Does it have that power? And so the city as hacker is an elementary version of that. And you can think of all kinds of examples where the city actually produces the failure of certain issues. Like when in, in New York City, when the big developers of high-rise buildings had to put around some sort of plaza, supposedly public space, but it was like a wind tunnel effect that you experienced, not publicness. That was, in a way, the city saying, this way, you're not going to make public space, just by bringing a bit of cement open space around a high-rise building. And so when you begin to look through that register, at all the variety of conditions, what works and what does not work. And you begin to attribute to that a, ca a capacity of the city to actually say, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, this worked. And the fact that very unexpected things work. I thought some of the cases that Hans Ulrich was showing, you know, in the middle of that beautiful green field, how you can make something work and actually urbanize that park. You know, the, the serpent, uh, that, that uh, yeah. Hyde Park, I guess. Um, now, so in that sense, I'm sorry, here, you know, the city as a knowledge partner. Now, one instance that I have been very interested in recently is something that I've come to call the global street. And the street can, of course, be a square. You know, the global street is a certain kind of space. And it is another way in which urban space becomes an urban capability. And I define the global street as a space where those without access to formal instruments of power can make, can make something, a politics, a movement, make, I love that Spanish, I grew up in Latin America, that, that phrase of the powerless and the poor who are not about to have a revolution, they don't have the power to do that, but they can say, estamos presentes, we're present, we're here. You know, that kind of making, urban space enables people to do that, even people who have nothing else. And that is a capability. That is an enablement that urban space uh, has. And I, again, it's a way of recovering. 
these barriers. So, so in this case, urban capabilities, you know, you can sort of argue, they arise out of a mix of people and spaces. You know, how do you make that work? Now, of course, then we have these images, these are the Cairo images of, here are these machines made for killing and for destroying, for killing people and for destroying buildings, remarked just by the multitude, so to say, you know. And of course, they could be shooting also, then you wouldn't have the people. But once you have that many people, they also have been hacked, right? And it's that mix of a kind of space that contains many witnesses in it. The office towers, the government building, you know, there's a lot of witnessing. And then lots of people and a certain type of open space. Here's another one. This is, this is sort of captures for me the anarchy of the city. People praying, some people meandering, there is a tank again, etc. You know. Now this is an extreme case, and in that sense, you might say it's exceptional, but it also is heuristic. It tells us something because it is extreme. There are far milder versions, of course. Now, one of the, and this is sort of the final part that I want to talk about, is that today, when I look at cities, mostly what I see are de-urbanizing trends. We have a lot of built up terrain, row after row of high rise residential building. That's not urban. That's built up terrain. So this notion of cityness, huh? a, a, a complex, a mix of capabilities, it's not just density through, you know, row after row of offices in office parks or row after row of residential high rises. There is something else. And so one of these, um, and, and then sort of, the, you know, the, the second point here, you know, what happens to urban, the urban capability to talk back, to tell us this is not working when you have that kind of situation. And so this is one example. This is not an urban, I, I'll elaborate in a second. This is not urban per se, but it's going to hit cities the most. And at the same time, cities are the place where we can contest. This is a new type of surveillance system. This has nothing to do with traffic <laughs> and nothing like that, or little stations. This is active surveillance of everybody who lives in the country. And this is a transnational system that includes the UK and includes Germany as very tight partners, and then some other countries. I'm just looking at these three. This is part of my research. This is not funded by Audi, by the way. <laughs> this is other things that I do. They would not want to get involved there. Now, this is 10,000 massive buildings. In other words, it's not clandestine. You see them, but you may not know that you are seeing one. The last one was built in, in Utah, Utah, whatever that state there. And um, the biggest concentration, as you can see, is in Washington. So we know that there are about 10,000 of these buildings. That is what we know. What we don't know is what we don't know. You get that picture, right? So this basically operates on a deurbanizing logic or on a logic, on undemocratic logic, whatever word, we, since we're talking cities. So it, it is surveillance for the sake of national security. For whom is that national security? For us, the citizens. To make us safe, we all have to first be suspect. That is, makes a strange feeling. And then when you begin to look at some of the details of what is inside this system, you know, it's sort of, it's very big, all these, you know, I, 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 I don't want to dwell too much on this now, but um, there is a lot of private contractors with top secret clearance who hire talent. And in this case, talent is top software developers, top computer scientists, top mathematicians who can develop the new algorithms, etc., etc. So you will recruit that talent wherever you find it. Indonesia, Russia, you know, certain places, Israel, certain places have very good talent on, in that. So there is a kind of, this is the only sympathetic moment in this whole story. There is a kind of denationalizing in that surveillance domain. And, and, and at the same time, so, you know, that's our, and at the same time, we, the citizens, are sort of confined to a narrower and narrower role, if you want, of, you know, little national suspect. Um, 
Another de-urbanizing force. This is a very short, brutal story that has to do with financializing the acquisition of housing, a financial project rather than a state project where the state helps citizens. So the result, I cannot dwell on this, huh? but the result is that right now, 14 million households have basically been thrown out or are about to be thrown out of their houses. They don't all become homeless. Huh? They get to cheaper houses, etc. But 14 million households is a vast number of people. I'm Dutch. My country has 16 million people. At the limit, 14 million households is 30 million people, twice the population of my country. So thrown out, 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 out where you go, I don't know, but you're out, everybody who lives. So this is an extreme version. This instrument, which is now illegal in the United States, that has enabled this, 15 million contracts were issued in five years, so they were very dodgy contracts, uh, and that is the result. And they have, of course, as they became illegal in the United States, they have traveled to other parts of the world. So right now Hungary has a million plus households under this type of regime, you know, this type of mortgage, and they have, they're under foreclosure. Latvia has 300,000. Now, these are, these are factors that de-urbanize urban space. Now, the irony is, especially going back to the surveillance system, here's the last thought, is that uh, precisely when we have such surveillance systems and other kinds of forces that I haven't talked about that have the capacity to de-urbanize urban space is when we most need cities, precisely for what I described here as this global street effect. And there are a list of other reasons that I have not talked about here. And so, in a sense, even while we celebrate the city and every politician, no matter what they know or don't know about cities, knows one thing, and that is that most people in the world live in cities, you know? They never look at why they are in cities. You know, we also have 220 million hectares of land that have been sold between, <laughs> between 2006 and 2011, and the biggest buyers now are financial firms and hedge funds. That is in the shadow of urbanization. That's just one item. There are many of these. But anyhow, the fact is that even as we celebrate cities, and so many people now have a line at least to utter about cities, cities, cities in the thick sense of that word, are actually at risk of being de-urbanized. And it is then, of course, the moment to recover. What is it that cities have? What are urban capabilities? And from there, then, this notion of, you know, does the city have speech? Does it talk to us? And talk that urbanizing language, if you want. And, uh, and how do we recover the capacity to sort of listen? What does it mean to listen to that urban speech? Thank you very much.